and there's the Mass Humanities logo. Uh, so uh, funding was provided by Mass Humanities, and we're very proud to be part of the Mass Humanities series called The Vote, which is a statewide initiative to uh, prompt conversations around civics. The Songus Industrial History Center is a partnership between the University of Massachusetts Lowell College of Education and the National Park Service. We're located in the historic boot cotton mills of Lowell National Historical Park. And the center is a hands-on place where students and teachers can learn about Ameri the American Industrial Revolution through activities and tours of the sites where history and science happened. In this time of remote learning, we are offering virtual field trips, which provide an in-depth look at a topic related to the Industrial Revolution, all facilitated by a professional educator with all of the energy and engagement of our in-person programs. And you can find out more on our website, uml.edu slash songus. And on this slide, you can see a couple of the um, online products that we're providing, a series of virtual field trips that we launched uh, this month with Immigration, Culture, and Community for grade four and Mill Girls Life and Work in Industrial City for grade five. Um, and we did, we launched those this week with some super, super successful feedback from um, our friends at the Pawtucketville Memorial School. They really enjoyed it. Um, and then uh, we will be following those up with some science topic programs. And then if virtual field trips aren't for you, we have what we're calling remote learning modules, which are created in the Google suite, uh, the G suite, uh, so that you can plug them right into your Google Classroom um, or other learning management system. And there are a series of primary documents and writing prompts for students. Um, some of the uh, remote learning modules also have videos and audio that go along with them. And uh, so we're really excited to provide those for teachers and those can all be found on our website. So let's get to the main event for this evening. Um, we're going to um, do a little who's in the room poll. So if you've been with us, you know what that's about. Uh, We'll have our feature presentation, then some Q&A. I'm gonna share with you the primary document and writing prompts for this session, and then some quick closing remarks. So I know you're all Zoom experts uh, right now. Um, so uh, feel free to use your video or not, whichever you prefer. Um, and then we will use the chat for the questions and answers. So if you have questions throughout Betsy's talk, please feel free to put those in the chat. And then, um, and then we'll have a little Q&A time afterwards. So I'm going to launch a quick poll here to find out who's in the room. So if you could please respond and tell us where you teach. So Kristen, I actually noticed two people in the room are my students. So ah, there's uh, uh, students rather than teachers. Wonderful, thank you. Excellent, so it looks like we're pretty Massachusetts um, weighted this evening. And because you can't see the results until I share them with you. And there you go. I'm going to launch a next poll, not that one. Still haven't gotten a hang of this poll thing yet. Uh, what grade do you teach? So if you are a teacher, um, you can say uh, what grade you teach. If you are a student, you can put in other. And it would help if I launched the poll. There you go. So it looks like we have some museum professionals with us, um, some high school teachers, and then also uh, elementary and middle. And then one last question. What subjects do you teach if you are a teacher? Let 
All right. So we have a variety of subjects here, history, social studies, civics, and then one elementary. Excellent. Thank you all for sharing. That just helps us to know who's in the room. Um, so I'd like to introduce our speaker this evening. Uh, tonight's topic is the success and failure of the 15th Amendment and African-American voting rights. Uh, Professor Elizabeth Herman Triant is a United States historian whose research and teaching interests include African-American history, particularly racial capitalism, urban history, slavery, and segregation. Professor Herman Triant's book, Threatening Property, Race, Class, and Campaigns to Legislate Jim Crow's Jim Crow Neighborhoods was published by Columbia University Press in the series Study in the History of U.S. Capitalism. Betsy's new book project, Lords of the Lash and Loom, Abolitionists, Anti-Abolitionists, and the Business of Manufacturing Slave-Grown Cotton, examines Lowell's textile factory owners' support for the institution of slavery alongside the growing abolitionist sentiment in the city in the antebellum years. Before joining the faculty of UMass Lowell, Betsy taught at St. John's University in New York and held a postdoctoral fellowship in agrarian studies at Yale University. She is the co-coordinator of UMass Lowell's race and ethnicity, race and ethnic studies minor and serves as faculty advisor to the Black Student Union. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so Betsy can share hers. So take it away, Betsy. Well, thanks so much for the introduction, Kristen, and thanks to all of you for coming. It's nice to see you. Uh, I know it's probably been a, a long day on Zoom for many of you, so thanks for coming out. Um, let me pull up my screen. Oops. All right. Um, so we are going to be talking about um, the 15th Amendment and its impact, and um, then kind of the undermining of this amendment. And uh, so we need to start at that moment right after the Civil War when the right to vote is extended to Black men. Um, you know, obviously not to Black women, right? Women don't get the vote until 1920. Um, but with the 15th Amendment, this right is extended to Black men, and you can see in this lithograph. Um, you know, some of the different, you know, backgrounds that these men are coming from, right? It's not just elite men, but you see, you know, a, a farmer, you see a, a union soldier. Um, you know, the idea is that, that all Black men should have this right. Um, certainly, men who served in the Union Army are kind of staking a special claim on, on the right to vote, saying, you know, we fought these traitors to the nation, shouldn't we be able to, um, you know, to sort of protect, you know, the rights of uh, citizens as voters, right? Not just in the military. But, um, but certainly this amendment is uh, essential, right? Um, Frederick Douglass said that slavery is not abolished until the black man has the ballot. Um, now, slavery was abolished, right? With the 13th amendment, um, which was added to the Constitution, you know, shortly before the 15th. But, but the idea is that freedom isn't meaningful if you can't vote to protect your rights. This lithograph tries to sketch out why that is, right? Like, what do you think about how how does the vote protect your rights? Um, you know, think about marriages, right? You see some marriages in the bottom on the sort of central left uh, panel, um, you know, the, the marriages of enslaved people weren't legally valid, right? Um, you, see, you see a teacher teaching a group of students, um, you know, African-Americans had no claim to education um, under slavery. So just, you know, you see all these, all these things that voters can protect, right? And, without that vote, they can't protect these things that are going to be such essential components of citizenship. So this is a lithograph that would have been sold to freed people. It's celebrating the 15th Amendment. It shows Ulysses S. Grant. It shows Grant's um, vice president. 
Um, it shows abolitionists, John Brown, Martin Delaney, Frederick Douglass. Um, it shows Hiram Revels, who was the first African American to serve in the US Senate. So, you know, all sort of key figures in, in bringing this about. And I mean, John Brown is certainly an interesting person to include here, right? You know, someone who, who led a, a raid on Harper's Ferry with the goal of bringing about a slave insurrection. So, you know, certainly someone who thought, you know, these rights are so essential that, that you know, even turning to bloodshed is worth it to bring about, um, you know, putting these, these rights into law. So with the 15th Amendment on, you know, it's part of the Constitution, Black men can not just vote, but they can also serve in office. And you can see a number of Black men here in a photograph showing, um, you know, the radical members of the South Carolina uh, state legislature. Uh, so there are whites here too, but um, but you know for the first time there are black men, and so black men they're going to serve. Um, you'll see more of them at the state level and state office, but they'll be um, on the federal level too. Now, um, critics, you know, opponents of of black voters describe this as Negro rule, saying that blacks sort of gained office with the goal of just sort of dominating and gaining access to white women and things like this. Um, historians dismiss this claim saying that there, there was no Negro rule. Um, I mean, this is a, an idea that you'd see in a film like Birth of a Nation, right? Which shows sort of black voters putting their feet up on the desks in the state legislature, things like this. I'll, I'll show you a, a photo from the Birth of a Nation in a moment. But, um, but anyway, so, so, you know, these folks um, did serve, but they didn't like dominate by any, by any means. Um, and so, you know, they served, but it's interesting to think about when they served, you know, what, what were the trends in um, office holding? And I thought we could look at who the black men were and black women, right? who served in the US Senate. Um, so we're not talking about state Senate, but, but uh, you know, at the federal level here. Um, and then looking at the um, black governors also. And just look at the years of service. And no doubt you notice, right, that people are serving during reconstruction. And then, um, and then again with the civil rights movement. You see the same pattern here. So these are the only African American governors we've we've had, right? Stacey Abrams came close, um, uh, Gillum came close, right? But but uh, but didn't make it, you know, in part because of the theme we're going to be talking about today, which is voter suppression. Um, but but again, you see this pattern, right, where people are serving during Reconstruction and then not for a long time. And so the question is why? What's happened? And um, what's happened is uh, the bringing about of Jim Crow, right? And, and particularly uh, the disenfranchisement of African-Americans. So the Southern states, you know, were quite unhappy obviously with the 15th amendment, right? It, it was a huge change for them to have a group of people who had so recently been in slavery now having political equality to whites. And so Southerners were really committed to doing everything they could to, to change this, right? To undermine um, this right to vote for, for black men. Um, and so they're doing things like passing poll taxes, literacy tests, um, property requirements. Um, they're making people who are trying to register to vote prove their age, uh, their occupation, their place of birth, et cetera. So just you know, to kind of walk through some of these policies, the poll tax, that says that you need to you know, pay a tax in order to register. In many states, it's cumulative. So if you haven't paid for a couple of years, you have to pay all those back years before you can register. Um, so that's expensive for poor folks, right? And often African-Americans have been poor in the South because they've been sort of kept as, you know, 
sharecroppers, you know, there's been very little economic opportunity for them. So they're sort of stuck in these lower level jobs that aren't well compensated. So the poll tax is a real burden. And I mean, when we think about a poll tax, I mean, some people I know have described these long lines that you see even today, right? People waiting in line for four or five hours, they'll describe that as a poll tax. And the reason for that is when you have people who are being paid by the hour who have to give up four or five hours of work in order to vote, that's a real financial loss, right? That's a hardship. Um, then literacy tests, I have, um, an example I'll show you in a moment, but a literacy test says that in order to register to vote, you need to have a certain competence, right? That you need to be able to interpret the state constitution or, you know, whatever it is. And these two things, you know, along with the other methods that are used, they're, they're race neutral, right? On, on the surface. So, I mean, a lot of people would say, well, you know, voting is an expensive endeavor. Shouldn't shouldn't citizens be willing to like chip in um, to you know f f to the to the voting process, right? Which shouldn't they be willing to help fund this? Um, and with the literacy test, again, the 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 argument will be: shouldn't voters be able to read and interpret our documents? Like, it, is is that really too much to ask? Um, and so they, they seem like these are reasonable requests and that they're applied to all equally, but in fact, um, they're not, right? And, and I'll show you, for example, in Mississippi, the literacy test, um, it would be at, at the discretion of the registrar, which part of the state constitution to ask someone who's trying to register to interpret. So if a white person is coming to register to vote, you could give them, you know, the thing on the left, right? All elections by the people shall be by ballot, which is not difficult to interpret. Whereas the section on the right, um, which, which um, you know, would more often, I'm sorry, uh, be applied uh, for a black uh, potential voter is much more complex. I'm not even going to read it to you. It's so long. It, there's so much legalese in it, right? It's, it's so difficult. Um, that very few people who aren't lawyers would be able to um, interpret this appropriately. You know, also though, I mean, given that it's at the discretion of the registrar, even if they had interpreted it correctly, the registrar could still say that they had not in fact um, interpreted it correctly. So just going back to this list though, um, you know, often states will make people fill out this paperwork stating their place of occupation. I mean, something like that is dangerous for an African American to put down. You know, who's your employer? Um, because then, you know, the information that they're trying to register to vote can be passed on to their employer, and they could lose their job, right? Um, whereas things like having to prove their age or their place of birth for people who had been in slavery, they won't have access to these documents, and so that's a real burden. Um, so, so anyway, I mean, there are all kinds of methods used. The different southern states, you know, you could kind of choose which ones you wanted to use, right? North Carolina would have a poll tax and a literacy test, you know, and so they'd sort of mix and match them. But generally, there's a fear that poor whites will also lose the right to vote along with African Americans. So most states will have these loopholes for poor whites such as the grandfather clause, right? Like if your grandfather was a registered voter, then you can register to vote even if you can't pay your poll tax. Or the understanding clause, the good character clause. With the good character clause, one registrar was asked, um, if Jesus Christ came to register to vote in your district, would you let him register? And the man said, that would depend entirely which way he was going to vote. So showing that, you know, that the registrars are, are, they're laser focused, right, on registering Democrats in the South, right? This is, this is sort of the period of the Democratic South and they're not looking to register Republicans. So disenfranchisement is accompanied 
by a campaign to sort of smear African Americans in the public eye, right? To, to make it clear that African Americans shouldn't be voters, right? That they're unworthy of citizenship, that they're dangerous, that you know, they're just not ready for, for this um, for this important um, civic duty, right? So you see books being published like The Negro a Beast. Um, or Thomas Dixon's The Klansman, which is the novel that the film Birth of a Nation was based on. And Birth of a Nation was, you know, the nation's first blockbuster, right? And it's, it's a film that romanticizes the KKK. It's about reconstruction. It depicts reconstruction as a great mistake um, that black men are given the right to vote and then they squander it, you know, they're in the state legislature drinking alcohol, putting, as I mentioned before, putting their feet up on the desks, um, pursuing white women, and then the KKK swoops in to save the day. I have a picture of it. You can see the, um, the film poster on the left, right, with the heroic Klansmen, and then this is a, um, a shot from the, the scene in the film where um, blacks are sort of running amok in the state legislature. But this was all just common for this day, right? This type of depiction of African-Americans. And I'll show you a couple of other depictions. Um, here you see a black man sort of hovering over the ballot. He's a like a vampire bat who's threatening um, white women on the left and white men. Um, so, you know, just this idea that if, if blacks are allowed to vote, they'll vote as a block, and then whites won't be able to kind of win against them, or, or that whites will then have to vote as a block either, and that there won't be room for different points of view among whites because their only goal will have to be to vote out blacks. This, uh, this political cartoon, and, and by the way, this one and this one, they're both from the Raleigh News and Observer published in 1898. So this one uh, says, good morning, have you voted the white man's ticket? And um, it should be noted that, um, that disenfranchisement was perceived as a reform, right? As a, as a progressive reform, this idea that in stopping black men from voting, you're, you're doing a, a positive good. You're sort of cleansing the electorate of people who shouldn't be voting. Um, you know, here, this one is suggesting you're protecting white women by getting rid of, of black voters. Um, so, so certainly these messages are being bombarded at Southerners um, to, you know, to justify the disenfranchisement of African-American men. So, so, you know, you have this period of Jim Crow where you know, all these Southern states are actively disenfranchising their black voters. Um, and meanwhile, African Americans are trying to fight against this and they become quite successful, you know, in their protests, you know, particularly with the Selma March. Um, so, you know, Selma is chosen kind of as, a, as an effective stage upon which to demand uh, voting rights. Uh, you know, the, the planners of the march knew that um, the police chief there was a, a brutal man and that they were going to get, you know, gas thrown at them, they were going to get beaten. And they, they needed that, right? They needed to show the world how much, how much pressure was being put on Blacks not to vote, right? How much resistance they were being met with. And once they had the, the world seeing that, that they could get the support for a Voting Rights Act, which was, um, which was signed into law in 1965. And uh, this is a really important document in that it outlaws uh, discriminatory policies like the ones we were talking about, such as the poll tax and the literacy test. Um, and it, it's been a really effective law um, in allowing people to vote. So it has, um, two sections that I wanted to mention, which have been um, undermined, right? So we had um, a Supreme Court case in 2013, Shelby County v. Holder, which um, kind of gutted the Voting Rights Act. So section five of the Voting Rights Act says that certain districts can't enact changes to their election laws and procedures 
without official authorization. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that then section 4B will define which districts these are, right? So these are ones that had a voting test in place um, or had less than 50% turnout for the 1964 presidential election. So, I mean, these are, these are districts in the South by and large, right? Um, and then the Shelby case, in the Shelby case, the Supreme Court says, it's not fair to assume that the South is unchanging, right? To say, you know, that just because the Southern states were trying to limit the right to vote during the Jim Crow era, that today they would be trying to, to do the same. Um, so, so they say, you know, it's unconstitutional to just sort of, you know, put these Southern states in a box and, and you know, have these assumptions about them. And so as soon as that um, decision was made, we had a dramatic rise in new laws like voter ID laws. Um, so, you know, it's called now voter suppression rather than disenfranchisement, right? But um, if you've read, if you're looking for a good book on this topic, I'd recommend Carol Anderson's book, One Person, No Vote. She, she walks through these different, um, these different policies, these different methods of voter suppression, like voter ID laws. And again, something like a voter ID law, a lot of people will say, well, why shouldn't you have to show an ID to vote, right? I mean, that's reasonable. There could be fraud, um, you know, impersonation, et cetera. And she, she talks about these very real barriers, right? Where if someone, you know, let's say they're from a city, you know, let's say they're a poor person in a city and they don't have, you know, maybe they live in public housing, but the public housing ID doesn't count as, you know, an acceptable form of voter ID. So they're told they need a driver's license, yet all of the DMVs in their area have been shut down. Um, so, um, you know, th th there, are, there are a lot of barriers that they're facing in trying to vote. Um, and trying to get these documents together that they need to vote. Um, and so, you know, there have been all, all kinds of methods, not just voter ID, but also, you know, the closing of polling stations. Um, it, it, I'll mention in a second, um, Georgia's exact, exact match law. Um, but this one, you know, if you're trying to register and maybe you are down in their documents, you know, my name's Elizabeth Herbin Tryant, right? If I had myself down as Elizabeth A. Herbin Tryant, and then I try to register as Elizabeth Herbin Tryant without the initial A, then that wouldn't be an exact match. So I'd be sort of purged from the voter rolls. Or, you know, let's say I was using just the name Herbin, you know, and anyway, so, so something like that will get people um, removed from the voter rolls. And it's very difficult, right? It's really onerous to get added back on. It's again, time off of work, um, et cetera. So let me go back to this. Um, so, you know, I wanted to turn to this question of why suppress the votes of African Americans? You know, back during Jim Crow, it was the Democrats trying to suppress the votes of African Americans. Um, post Shelby, it's been more Republicans. And I think you can see the reason why when you look at these numbers, right? Blacks just aren't voting Republican in high numbers, like black women in particular, right? If you look at, um, these are the, the, um, the numbers from the 2016 election, right? So less than 2% of black women voted for Donald Trump. And, you know, I think a lot of Republicans, their strategy has been rather than trying to win over these voters to make it so that these voters can't vote, right? Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting strategy considering that the country, you know, it's becoming more diverse. If you look at like Texas, Florida, you know, I, I'm not sure how long that strategy is gonna work given the demographic shifts in these states. But it, anyway, it is the, it is the strategy that's, that's been used. Um, and so, you know, certainly an interesting case study, right, is Georgia in the 2018 elections where um, we had the Secretary of State Brian Kemp running for governor um, against Stacey Abrams. And so Brian Kemp's job was to manage voters, right? To determine who's, 
who's eligible to vote. So, you know, he's behind this exact match law. Um, so he's purging all these black voters, right? Because it turns out that people who move more often, um, you know, people who sort of are affected by this exact match law tend to be people of color. And so he's purging all these people of color, um, it, you know, while he's running for the governorship against a black woman. So Stacey Abrams, you know, is claiming that, you know, this was an illegitimate election, right? She says at the end, I'm not going to concede, right? Concession suggests that I accept this as a, you know, as a fair election, which, which I don't, right? And she now runs an organization that I, I believe is called Fair Fight, um, which is addressing this issue of voter suppression today. But that's all I have on um, my presentation. But if anyone has questions, I'm happy to, um, to discuss them. So go ahead and um, I put uh, Professor Carol Anderson's book um, in the chat um, and also putting um, the link to Stacey Abrams uh, group in the chat per uh, Betsy's note. So um, if you have questions, um, you can go ahead and populate the chat. Um, I know that um, one of, so, so I'm, I'm going to try to connect last week's presentation with this week's presentation. I know you weren't there, that's okay, um, Betsy, but the the, um, the the word that keeps coming back, and, and you didn't say it tonight, but I, I, I feel it was there uh, underneath the level of sort of power, who has it, who doesn't. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about that connection between and the suppression of power and race? So how that sort of connected, you touched on a little bit at the end, but what is it about that, the, the, the lack of power on the behalf of African-Americans, the desire for power, like you said, freedom isn't meaningful unless you can use your vote to protect it, right? So where does that, who has the power, who doesn't have the power and the presence of race in the mix? Last week, it was the presence of gender in the mix that we talked about. Now it's the presence of gender in the mix. I mean, the race in the mix. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure, yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, I guess I mentioned this earlier in the presentation, but before the Civil War, white elites had, you know, they had economic power, they had political power, they had social power. And the Civil War brings about this huge transformation where they're in danger of, you know, losing the world they've built right, where they're going to lose their political power if the radical Republicans have their way, right, if the radical Republicans can, like, redistribute land and, and you know, it, you know, many of them are trying to punish um, Confederates by saying that they should no longer vote, right, so, so loss of political power is huge, and then, of course, political power is often tied to economic power, I mean, these were people who owned slaves, who owned a lot of land, um, and they're desperate to get African Americans back on the plantations, you know, growing the same crops, you know, namely cotton that they'd been growing pre um, pre Civil War, and they want political power in part to hold on to that economic system of of sort of forcing these people to do this labor and to not, still not pay them, right? Um, so they're able to do that through sharecropping, right, where people get paid at the end of the season when the crop comes in, but they may get paid, right? And that's sort of a different discussion. Um, you know, they'll get paid if the crop is good and if the landlord doesn't have debts, etc. Um, but anyway, so, so I mean, these people, they're, they're desperate to hold on to power, right? And then meanwhile, African Americans are eager to get power too. Right, they want land of their own. They want the right to vote. Um, they want social equality, and to the extent that they're successful in gaining power, which I mean, they are in many ways. Right, they're. I mean, it's it's amazing. Before 1910, African Americans in the South are able to accumulate a fair amount of land. Um, I mean, we're so used to the story of sharecropping and like the cycle of debt, but even 
in the middle of that, they're able to, to gain land, to gain small farms. And, and so this is a real threat to those who had previously had power, right? Um, so, you know, and, and, you know, they are getting some political power, some political appointments. Um, you know, we, we, you saw in those slides that they have some political offices. And so there's going to be an incredible backlash against that, right? I mean, I think these backlashes that you see are about Blacks wielding power, right? People who, who feel deeply uncomfortable with Blacks having access to power. I think, you know, if just looking at, at today, right? I mean, I think a lot of what we're seeing today is a reaction to, to the existence of Barack Obama, right? To the fact that Obama had political power and wielded it. And so, you know, now there are a lot of white supremacists who I think wanna stop that from happening again. Um, and I mean, the, the Obama coalition, right? This group of people who put Obama into office, I mean, I think, that's the, and you'll see this if you read Carol Anderson's book, right? She she starts her book out talking about how after the 2016 election, um, a lot of people criticized black voters saying, oh, they didn't turn out for Hillary Clinton like they did for Barack Obama. Like they, they just didn't show up. But her argument is that it's not that they didn't show up. It's that, you know, this election was post um, post Shelby, right? So many of them had lost the right to vote. And so they actually, couldn't, you know, they couldn't show up in the same numbers. So it's a story of 2016 being the first presidential election that we had post um, Shelby County v. Holder. And, you know, just, you know, so this is a story of like backlash against Black success, right? I want to touch a little bit on the, um, the voter ID laws. We don't have that in Massachusetts, but I was actually having this conversation last night with, uh, over the over at the dinner table with my boyfriend who happens to be African American, and he he's very he lives in Boston. He's very much like I'm going down to the polls and I'm going to show them my ID and I want to make sure it's me voting, you know, that they know it's me. And 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 I was like, you don't have to show them your ID. It's Massachusetts, so, but I want to make sure they know it's me. <laughs> It, so, you know, he was really advocating for like people having to show ID to like confirm that it's their vote, right? Not somebody else's vote being cast. How does that, how does that work with this? Like you talked a little bit on it with, you know, states that are passing these voter ID laws that become, um, dis they, they dis end up disenfranchising a lot of people yet the logical point of view would be, why shouldn't people have to provide ID to prove that it's their vote, right? One person, one vote. Yeah, so I mean, this issue of fraud, that's another thing that Carol Anderson does a good job on. And there's actually a, she, she I think she gives a good synopsis of her book. If you watch, um, there's a clip on YouTube where she's being interviewed by Trevor Noah. And so he raises this question, right? He says, well, the Republicans are claiming that there's a huge amount of voter fraud, right? People impersonating voters and other types of fraud. And she cites all these studies that have showed, you know, and, and some of the studies are done by people who have an interest in showing, you know, yes, indeed, there is fraud, right? That these, that these new laws are justified in order to stop fraud. And they're able to come up with very little, right? There's actually very little voter fraud in the US, certainly not enough to justify disenfranchising, you know, large groups of people. Um, it, but but that's kind of the thing that that um, that Republicans have been pointing to lately, right? Is is just this idea that we will have fraud if we don't have these methods in place to ensure that you know only the people who should be voting are doing so. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's, there's, in addition to, to sort of this rhetoric about fraud, right, I think behind it, there's a sense that only certain people should be voters, right, people who can afford a driver's license, you know, people who, I think some people have a, a sense that a voter should be a particular kind of person and that not just anyone should be a voter, right? Um, you should be educated on the issues, you should be literate. I mean, you can you can make all of these all of these lists. 
Um, but I mean, actually the constitution right now doesn't have any provisions like that, right? It's supposed to be, everyone can vote, right? If you're over 18, you can vote. Um, but yeah, the Southern states have tried, and, and I mean, not just the Southern states now, I mean, I'm sure you've read about um, states trying to um, sort of force that, force uh, Indian reservations to, to have um, numbers, right? So you can't register to vote unless you have a street address, right? But on a lot of Indian reservations, there aren't street addresses. So, I mean, it's, so it's not just the South, um, but um, anyway, sorry, I, I kind of lost my, my train of thought here, but just the point being, right, that, that there's a sense of who should be voting and it's not, it's not inclusive. Sarah? Yeah. And I think that that that's uh, the, I think the I think a lot of what a lot of people don't understand is that states control who votes, right? It, it, that's that's the rub. That was the rub of my conversation last night. That yeah, the federal government can say anybody over eighteen can vote, but on the state level, there's still that states' rights, you know. <laughs> right. So Sarah, I think you had your hand up. Oh, did you, Sarah? Sorry. Go ahead, Sarah. I had kind of like two different questions. Um, the first being like, I'm under the impression that voter suppression is not very relevant in Massachusetts. Um, so my first question would be, do we see it at all in Massachusetts? And also, if, if voter suppression is much more prevalent in the South, how do we as, I guess, Northerners help? Like, how do we do something about that, even though we're up here? Right. Um, Kristen, has, has Sue Kim's talk happened yet? Because she was going to talk about voter suppression in Lowell, right? Yeah, no, that is um, coming up in the week after the election. So I'll talk, I can talk about that in a second. Okay. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's directly relevant to the question, though. I mean, you could give a plug for it, but also, do you want to talk at all about, about Sue's lawsuit? Sure. So there was um, on on November 10th, we're going to have a presentation on the voting rights lawsuit uh, uh, with a, a coalition of immig immigrants from the city of Lowell um, versus the city of Lowell and the at large voting format um, for city council and for school board. Um, so uh, Professor Sue Kim from the UMass Lowell English Department and Oren Selstrom, who was the um, the attorney for the, the plaintiffs are going to talk about how they sort of fought against that voter suppression of that at large because when you when you it's a numbers game so it became a lawsuit um, that's a little teaser but I liked um, your question Sarah about what can we do about it up here for our friends in the south yeah I mean so just to say a little bit more about that lawsuit, I think the issue is that Lowell has so many, um, so many people of color, so many immigrants, so many Asians, yet none of those people were getting onto the, to the city council, right? Um, and so, you know, the argument is that in making it district wide, right? people are voting in only whites, where if you broke it down into smaller groups, it would be a more diverse group of people who are getting onto the city council. Um, so, I mean, there, there are, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say that Massachusetts has any of these laws like the, you know, the voter ID law or anything like that, but, you know, something like the way that districts are drawn is something you could look at, right? Um, but as for this question of what we can do in the North, I mean, I think we can support organizations like Fair Fight. Um, I mean, you can send money, you can, you know, lobby politicians to to pay attention to this issue. But I mean, it, it is truly an important issue, right? Um, I mean, the fact that it's it's shaping, you know, the 2016 election, it could have an impact on this election. Um, you know, just the idea that that the people aren't being heard um, is really alarming. Um, and I mean, Kristen, do you know of other groups besides Fair Fight that would be worth um, worth joining? 
I don't, but that is something I can research and I will send out to folks with the email with this recording tomorrow. Um, I just think in general, educating yourself and your family and your friends and anybody you come into contact with about the state of the electoral process in this country is important um, because there are a lot of people who do think it's one person, one vote and that everything is fair and there are voting laws for a reason. But when you pull back the surface, as, as Professor Hervin Chai has done for us tonight, you realize that it's not as equitable as one would imagine. Um, and are there any other questions before I go ahead and, and show the um, resources that I wanted to share for this evening? All right, let me, I'm gonna quickly share our resources for tonight's talk. Um, and then if the question comes to you between now and the end, um, we can certainly do that. Um, are you see, seeing a screenshot of my website? Okay, excellent. So of my website, of the website. Um, so this is the, the, the website for this evening's talk. Um, and then about halfway down the page, there's two links, one for a set of documents at a Google site and one for Google Form, which is questions and writing prompts. We've also listed the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks that match up with the topic that we talked about tonight. In this website, um, a lot of the documents that were referenced in tonight's discussion are excerpted here. Um, so for example, uh, one of the documents we've referenced is actually the Massachusetts, uh, Common Commonwealth of Massachusetts Constitution. So we've shown how it, it changes over time um, and who can vote. The 15th Amendment and the 24th Amendment and then the Voting Rights Act. So again, we're sort of layering all of those things about voting, who gets to vote and, and who says who gets to vote. So it's not just document excerpts, we've um, pulled a political cartoon. So this one is addressing poll taxes. And then also this is an excerpt from a literacy test that was referenced. Um, there are dozens of these over different states and um, periods of time. We just pulled this one um, from 1965, Alabama, and, and excerpted some questions. The uh, voter ID laws uh, question comes up to play here in these. Um, we have two graphs to compare and contrast um, different groups of people and the number of people who actually show up um, to vote in elections. So we asked students to analyze the graphs. And then finally, it would not be a set of documents without an excerpt from Shelby V. Holder. Um, we have an excerpt from um, Robert's opinion and Ginsburg's dissent. Uh, so you can contrast uh, what the two of them were talking about. And then an excerpt from a newspaper or from an article one year later talking about what changes had been implemented um, in those states that had previously been covered by the Voting Rights Act. In the questions and writing prompts, uh, if you click that link, you'll be um, asked to make a forced copy. So this will be all your own to put in your learning management system. And then you can see each section, each page is given a section in the document and they, um, their writing prompts compare and contrast, you know, based on your knowledge, some analysis questions. And then the final writing prompt is we ask students to write a new section to the Voting Rights Act that outlines statutes and enforcement to prevent voter disenfranchisement in the 21st century. So carefully considering what types of modern concerns would need to be addressed based on what they learned through the documents that they've, <clears throat> excuse me, um, been reading. So feel free to use as much or as little as you would like of this. You can excerpt it, um, teach it up, teach it down, depending on your grade level. 
So um, that is more or less all I had prepared for this evening. I do want to offer one more resource that I have offered the last couple of um, nights. It's a podcast called And Nothing Less. And it's a podcast um, done by, co-sponsored by the National Park Service, and it's on the history of, of um, the suffrage movement and uh, the, the um, voting rights for women. And it touches on some people who are the lesser known players in that movement. So any final questions or comments? Betsy, anything else you'd like to share, anything? from the group? I mean, I guess just when, you, when you're talking about this idea of having students kind of rewrite the Voting Rights Act, I mean, I, I think that, you know, with the Shelby decision saying that, you know, it's illegal to sort of target the South as seeking to disenfranchise particular voters. I mean, I think it needs to be that all of the states would be sort of under a program where in order to make these changes to who can vote, they need to get you know, pre-clearance, right? That's what the Voting Rights Act said is that you have to get pre-clearance from, I'm blanking, but I think it's like this, the State Department, uh, the Justice Department, right? You need to get pre-clearance approval before you can change these laws, right? Rather than after, because it's too harmful if it's afterwards, if, you know, you pass a voter ID act and then people have to sue and then it's in the courts for years, right? It's, it's much better to have this program of preclearance. And so perhaps rather than just assuming that the Southern states are the ones that are seeking to disenfranchise voters, you know, as we've seen now, right, with, um, I think it's, sorry, I've gotten tired. It's been a long day. I think it's North Dakota, right, that had the, the one about the, um, about the, the street addresses, right? It's clear it's, it's extended beyond the South. And so any Voting Rights Act should now, you know, in my opinion, require that, you know, that all states would have to be sort of subject to this preclearance approval process. My thinking. So I see there's a comment in the chat here about a mini series produced by Vox on Netflix about voter suppression in today's election. Cool. Um, and, Am and Amazon has a new documentary too. I mean, the central figure in it is Stacey Abrams. It's mm -hmm. called All In, I think. I think it's called All In. Um, but, you know, it, certainly if you're interested in these issues, it has some great footage um, and great interviews with people who've been key on this. Excellent. Um, just a little teaser for next week's presentation. Um, next Tuesday, uh, October 27th, uh, Becoming a Citizen and the Importance of Voting, the Immigrant Experience. So Chiara St. Pierre, who's a managing attorney uh, for Immigration Legal Services at the International Institute of New England, is going to talk about the process of citizenship, who becomes one, how do you become one, what does it mean to have birth rate citizen, what it means to have green card, um, how do you become a voter? All of those sorts of things um, that are sort of wrapped up in, in uh, who's an American and who's a citizen. Um, and then we're off the week of the election. And then the following week is um, Sue Kim and Oren Selstrom on the Lowell um, voting rights case. And then we wrap up with um, activating youth voices of Jeff Foster from UTech and um, Mike Nagel from uh, Lowell Public Schools talking about uh, getting youth active in the voting and um, cause, causes without the right to vote, uh, being active in causes without having the right to vote. So um, if there are any other questions, um, I see, oh, see some other things ended up in the chat. I will make sure that those get in the notes that get distributed uh, with the recording for this tomorrow. Um, you please share the recording with your friends. And um, if there's nothing else, uh, thank you all. Thank you, Betsy. Um, hope we'll see you next week and have a good night. Thanks everyone for coming. Take care.